Hello, bonjour, and folcha to Festival Bloomsday Montreal 2022. My name is Kathleen Fee, and I'm artistic director of this festival that celebrates Irish culture in Montreal. And while there's a lot to celebrate, it's important for us to acknowledge that we are based on the unceded Indigenous territory of Diodiage, and that the Ganyagehaga Mohawk Nation is the custodian of these lands and waters. The theme for this year's festival is ripples. Ripples through water, of course. Montreal has claims on being the world's largest inland seaport through time and through memory. This is a big year for memories and celebrations, the 100th anniversary of the publication of Ulysses by James Joyce. And to launch this year's festival, here are His Excellency Eamon McKee, Ireland Ambassador to Canada, and Professor John McCourt, author of Consuming Joyce, a comprehensive look at the fraught history of James Joyce's Ulysses over the 100 years since its publication, in conversation with veteran broadcaster Dennis Trudeau. Let's hear what they have to say. Thank you, Kathleen, and hello, everyone. Welcome to Festival Bloomsday Montreal, our 11th edition, 2022, partially still online, partially in person. And uh, I'm very pleased to be here to kick off Festival Bloomsday with two very special guests. Joining me from Ottawa, his Excellency Eamon McKee, Ambassador of the Republic of Ireland to Canada. He's a career diplomat, historian. He's been posted to Washington, New York, South Korea, Israel, took part in the Good Friday Agreement, Ambassador uh, negotiations of the Good Friday Agreement. Ambassador McKee, welcome. It's my pleasure to be with you, Dennis. And I must say also, uh, you're, you and the Embassy are a good friend of uh, Festival Bloomsday Montreal. So thank you for your support and your continuing uh, uh, affection for us. And from Italy, Professor John McCourt, who's the author of a just published book, Consuming Joyce, 100 Years of Ulysses in Ireland. John McCourt's professor of English literature and head of the Department of Humanities at Università di Maserata. And he's president of the International James Joyce Foundation. He's also a friend of uh, Festival Bloomsday Montreal because he has been in Montreal as a visiting professor. John McCord, welcome. Thank you very much, um, Dennis. I'm delighted to be back at the Bloomsday, the Montreal Bloomsday Festival. I think it's my third time. Um, I'm hoping one of these years I'll get to be there in person. Um, it's lovely to participate <laughs> through the through remote, but it'd be lovely also to be there one of these years. But of course, yeah, as you say, I've I've been in Montreal and I spent a term as a Peter O'Brien visiting scholar in in Concordia in the Irish Studies program. So delighted to be to be back today. Thank you for thank you for the invitation. And uh, Eamon McKay, have you, have you uh, and John McCourt met before? No, we haven't. And uh, delighted to meet you, John. And uh, looking forward to the discussion. Envious too that you're in Italy, actually. So good for <laughs> you. But uh, thank you. It, it almost feels like usually here in Ottawa because it's 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 I think we're going to get 80 degrees here so it's it's uh I hope uh, my wife and I love coming to Canada on the basis that we had four seasons we didn't realize there were only two <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay well it's yeah it's something it's nearly 90 degrees here today we've gone in a matter of 10 days from winter to summer yeah and um, it's impressively hot in Rome today but look could be worse there are worse places we could be there are worse places well, we're in the same boat for that. We've gone from winter to summer in the last 10 days as well in uh, Ottawa and Montreal. So uh, it beats just winter, actually, I guess you could say. So, the, the you know, 100 years ago, 2022, Ulysses, 1922, I should say, 100 years ago from 2022, Ulysses was published for the first time, James Joyce. Uh, had struggled with it and his publishers had struggled with getting it published. A hundred years later, there are not too many novels published in, in 1922 who have the following and the aura around them that Ulysses does. And I don't know, what's your explanation? To get us started, Ambassador McKee, what's your explanation? I think when, when you read it today, it's still shockingly intimate. I mean, he says things without, I mean, it's almost as if Joyce doesn't have a filter. 
he just is going to put it on the page. And it's, it's even by today's standards, it's incredibly direct. So you can imagine the, the audacity and the intellectual courage a hundred years ago of breaking through all the proprieties and what was expected in terms of your behavior and what would be said. And of course, that shock is what caused people's outrage, you know? I think the other point is, and I, it's a funny thing to say, but, you know, when you read it as a, as a young man, you kind of identify with Stephen, you know? And then now I identify with Leopold Bloom. And <laughs> I, he kind of makes you identify with every single character. He puts you in their head. Um, and so Joyce becomes, as you get older, Joyce becomes even more of a phenomenon as a writer, as a thinker, as an intellectual, because you just say, how did he do that? I mean, did he remember every single thing anybody ever said to him? You know, his capacity for empathizing with people and the way he brings this across. And of course, he structured it in such a great way, too. You know, so I think the degree to which any writer can get the reader to be in, in the minds of their character is its strength. And he does that with everybody in, in, with incredible economy as well. And, and, and John McCourt, before we get to discussing your book and the work that went into it, your explanation uh, for the continuing, you know, liveliness of, of the Joyce community and the discussion of it. Well, there are many, many reasons for it, I think. I mean, it's undoubtedly just such an extraordinarily human book. Um, it, it transmits all of Joyce's kindness and, and humanity went into the book. Um, a little less went into the actual way he lived his life, I would say. So um, it's a book which um, makes us think. It's a book which makes us laugh. It's a book which means different things, as Ambassador McKee said, to different generations of people. And it's a book which declares itself in a different way uh, over different times and in different places. So the, the so-called academic Joyce industry, for example, was hugely um, powerful initially in, in Europe, in, in France, and then, of course, the United States in the period after the war. Um, and now in the last 20 or 30 years, the Irish have finally kind of taken Joyce to heart. Irish academics have begun to do the real work that needed to be done and that they were reluctant to do for the reasons that the ambassador mentioned of propriety. He was kind of embarrassing in a way, Joyce, because he asked too many awkward questions and he, he made us through his books ask awkward questions. But Joyce, I think, took a very long view on the success of his book. I mean, it was published in just a few hundred copies initially. Um, almost privately, if you like, um, published, and of course was a cause celebre. But I think he wrote thinking that it would come into its own, as it has, and it's almost a book that's way ahead of its times. And um, I, it's it's almost as relevant to our own times today as it is to the times in which it was written. And there's an extraordinary freshness, I think, in the in the use of in the use of language. Sometimes, if you look at translations of Ulysses. They, they seem so dated, maybe a translation done 30 years ago. When you read Ulysses itself, it seems as fresh as it was 100 years ago today. Now, you, uh, you mention, and I think this is one of the things that we see in your book as well, that both Ireland and the Irish government and Irish institutions and Irish academe, Irish literary critics, were both late to the Joyce game, late to the Ulysses game. Um, for for the reason I guess you the propriety reason you you bring up, uh, Eamon McKee, what do you, how do you view that? Well, I think we have to go back to the time. This was you know the, the Catholic Ireland that emerged from independence had a view of Ireland that just did not embrace Joyce or Dublin or the European intellectual movement. This was a very this was a partitioned country, so that uh, the the southern state of the twenty six counties was overwhelmingly Catholic. So when Fianna Fáil comes into power in 1932, for example, there's a Eucharistic Congress, an enormous public display of piety. So the propriety of society was even more deeply ingrained by the Catholic ethos. And it took us decades to get away from that. Um, and yes, when you and so when you read Joyce, I mean, again, he is, he is shockingly profane and blasphemous, actually, as a writer. You know, he makes no bones about this, that he has struggled. We know that Joyce was part of, I mean, for... His, his mid to late teenage years, he was part of a sodality of St. Mary. I mean, he really did kind of test the faith, as it were. And of course, he rejects it. Now, of course, you, you also think that Joyce loves that dynamic between 
piety and profanity between prudery and sexuality. So he knows what he's working up against, but the society that, that prevails throughout the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, really up until the 70s and 80s when it begins to return is a highly Catholic society. And officially it's a Catholic society. And the Catholic Church, the Catholic Church is the only national institution throughout the 19th century. It's more powerful than the, than the government. When the government comes in in 1922, it's the junior partner. So the government is actually kind of, uh, you know, playing second fiddle to a church that the church, don't forget, it baptizes you at birth, educates you, puts you in, you know, takes care of you in a hospital, marries you and buries you. I mean, the Catholic church pretty much dominated your life. So there's not much room for Joyce. You know, Joyce is just simply too subversive. You know, but as John was saying, his subversion is what, is what makes him modern. He's, he's subverting everything. He's subverting God. He's subverting institutions. He's subverting nationalism. I mean, one of the things when you, when you reread Joyce as well, a lot of it is highly political because he's, he's writing at a time when there are these profound political struggles going on as Ireland transitions from, you know, looking for home rule, fighting for home rule. Um, one of the points I make in Canada is that Canada was the future Ireland was supposed to have, but never did. We <laughs> were looking for what Canada had. Right up, I mean, when John Redmond gets home rule on the books in 1914, where does he go? He goes to Canada for a celebratory tour. And then suddenly you've got 1916, boom, all of that future is shoved aside and there's a new radical future. The radicalism of the War of Independence is lost by the Civil War and you get this incredibly conservative group of revolutionaries that take over there's simply no room for an expansive challenging subversive intellect and writer like james joyce it's just there's simply no room there you know but what's happened now is the ireland i grew up in the 60s that ireland is gone i mean it's literally gone it's been wiped away by by all kinds of different forces and so now the the the, the place is clear for us to really enjoy joyce and from the embassy perspective, and in the last number of years, we've seen the, the, the Bloomsday Festival just explode in Dublin, you know. The final point I would make um, is that we have to remember as well that Irish nationalism is based around a kind of rural bucolic view. To be Irish, you had to be a peasant farmer speaking English, ideally playing hurley and reciting ancient poetry from your kind of atavistic memory. You weren't supposed to be urban and Dublin. The urban thing, the manufacture thing, was all British and alien. So there was no room. And don't forget, the Irish never set up cities. Gaelic Ireland didn't like cities. They were all set up by the Vikings. They were taken over by the Normans. And I think we still struggle with this. We don't, the, the official canon of nationalism does not include Dublin. In, in contrast, you can't imagine Britain without London or France without Paris. In Ireland, you almost have to have an act of will to put Dublin in a kind of nationalist framework. So for all of these kinds of reasons, I mean, one of the reasons I love Joyce is because he takes dear old dirty Dublin and polishes it like some eternal jewel in his work. And, and you can, and when you walk around Dublin, you can still feel that and appreciate that, you know? So he kind of gives to Dublin something that nationalism never, never yielded it, you know? John McCord, is Dublin late to the appreciation of, jo of Joyce and Ulysses as the way the government and the, uh, and, and the uh, academe were? Um, well, no, I mean, Dublin has always had a relationship with Joyce. I think, I think um, the important thing is that Joyce, I would see Joyce as part of that early radical kind of movement in Ireland that, that led to um, the, the, the 1916. And he's, his work is extremely political. He had a very different vision of, of the Ireland that should take shape to the very conservative Ireland that took shape in the 1920s. But, you know, as early as 1907, he was describing Dublin and Dubliners as a city that wore the mask of a capital. He was he was seeing the potential in Dublin to become that capital. He was doubting if that was ever going to come. Um, and of course, it did come and it came in his lifetime. And of course, it came in 1922 the year of the foundation of the state, also the year of the publication of Joyce's Ulysses. And um, it's not surprising. His book came out just after the, if you like, the start of the Civil War. So, I mean, clearly people's minds were otherwise, otherwise, otherwise occupied. Joyce wasn't going to be the first thing on their minds. And almost miraculously, he did get some attention in Ireland. There were always a few readers who realized how relevant he was to the country. 
how he provided a vision of the country. There were people like Emer O'Duffy uh, who wrote reviews and, and Mary Collum who wrote reviews in America, Irish American, um, uh, talking about Joyce's importance and seeing Ulysses as a kind of an epic of the nation, providing both a sense of its past and of its future, I'd say. So he his book suffered initially because it clashed, I think, its timing. Joyce's timing was always terrible in terms of his publications. I mean, he, his, his first two works, The Portrait and, and Dubliners, came out and clashed with the First World War. Finnegan's Wake came out in 1939 and, and clashed with the Second World War. And um, so this, this was, a, in a way, a great shame. And, and, and Ulysses as well had this, had this clash. Um, I think they struggled in Ireland, as, as Ambassador McKee has, has said, um, with uh, the what was perceived as as being very a, a very anti-Catholic book, and what I think really drove a lot of the cross humpers mad was that Joyce knew far more about Catholicism than any of them did, because they were an extremely obedient, um, docile kind. It was an extremely obedient, docile kind of Catholicism where you did what you were told and were, were taught not to ask too many questions. And Joyce's whole aim is to ask us to ask questions to ask questions of our faith, to ask questions of our political beliefs, and to, you know, to always kind of put the cat among the pigeons, to, to doubt the truth of any particular discourse. And um, so I think that's partly why his book was so hard for so many of the orthodox thinkers, if you like, in, our, in the Ireland of his time to, to come to terms with them. And then as the century went on, uh, in the 1950s, Ireland was still a very closed, inward looking provincial place. Um, struggling to come to terms with this great book, which is the first proper Irish novel of the city. Um, because before, he, Joyce had nothing to go on in writing a novel about Dublin. The English experience in the novel was, was of no use to him. He wasn't bothered with that. Um, hence, we got the short stories. And Ulysses, if you like, is like this big short story because so little happens in it. Um, and in the 50s, you get people like, um, like Flann O'Brien, the great novelist. And... And you get a number of Joyce fans, intellectuals, who were also working in, in, in the public service. So there were high, highly valued and highly respected civil servants who had this kind of dark private side in that they loved James Joyce. But they were terribly conflicted. One of these was John Garvin, who was secretary of one of the government ministries. And he both loved Joyce and also utterly found him despicable for his anti-Catholicism. And he was totally conflicted. You know, and he was one of the great proponents of Joyce, but he was deeply troubled by, I think, the radical nature of Joyce's work. So he could appreciate it on one level, and on another level, he was terribly, terribly uncomfortable with it. And I really think it wasn't until the 1980s, really, the centenary of Joyce's birth, 1982, that the tide really began to turn in Ireland. Because as late as 1967, when the first International Joyce Symposium was held in Dublin in the Gresham. They couldn't find an Irish academic willing to talk about Joyce. They found, a few, they found a few poets who were willing to say a few words. But the general attitude towards the symposiasts, as they call them, the Joyce, not the Joyce symposers, the Joyce posers, was utterly negative and they were derided in the Irish newspapers. And, and Irish newspapers loved nothing over those decades more than yet another academic book written by an American critic, which would have made some historical errors probably, and just poking fun at them. And, um, but not doing the hard work themselves to kind of give us the works that were needed. So um, it was an extraordinarily um, long and difficult journey for, for Joyce to be accepted in Ireland. But I think from the very first days, there were always some people in the country who got him, who realized his importance and who stuck their necks out even to defend him. Mm -hmm. You have done for your book, Consuming Joyce, 100 Years of Ulysses in Ireland, a thoroughgoing, if not exhaustive, research of the archives, newspapers, magazines, speeches, resolutions of city councils, uh, debates. Um, and and it, it creates, I've had the chance to read it in an ebook form. And it does give that impression that there was always somebody answering, you tell the story of a Christian brother who was teaching children, young, young men, and, and, and yet he was praising Joyce to them. Yeah, I mean, this is true. Um, I think, I, as, as I said, I think Joyce always had 
his readers, they were a little bit, they, they didn't, they kept in a shadow for the most part. Um, but I think the Christian brother in question was, was in towards the north of Ireland. And I think he was probably telling them to rejoice most of all because he's, he was a successful Irish writer. Um, I'm not sure how deeply the Christian brother had actually explored Joyce's texts, but he did, that said, introduce, introduce um, readers to him. I mean, my first introduction to Joyce was through a Jesuit teacher of mine um, in school. Now he wasn't on the Irish schools curriculum in, in my time. And indeed he's hardly on the Irish schools curriculum today. He's on the curricula here in, in Italy, for example, they, all the kids read, read Dubliners, um, but they, that wouldn't be the case in Ireland. But he was, he was snuck into our lives in religion class um, by a Jesuit priest, who Father Bruce Bradley, who later wrote about Joyce's school days. But he, he had us read uh, Joyce and Thomas Merton, Seven Story Mountain, and a portrait of the artist side by side as two representing two figures going in opposite directions through the same territory. Um, but that was very unusual in the time, and most of the of the Jesuits in the school would have looked down on Joyce, and they would have described him as a kind of a corner boy who lost the run of himself. Um, but we were lucky to have a kind of a an illuminated, enlightened figure who I think actually was quite important in making Joyce acceptable in the changing Ireland of the 1980s, when things were finally beginning to move. Ambassador McKee, was he on your curriculum when you were a student, was Joyce? <laughs> No, not at all. I mean, uh, we we had a, a great English teacher, like like a lot of us. There's usually a teacher that's quite a formative character, uh, Michael Smith. He was wonderful. But we would have these adult conversations in in high school, secondary school. But he would say, "You can't write this down in the leaving certificate because you might have a nun correcting you." So you, there was this kind of duality between what you can talk about and what you can actually write down. Even even when I was going to school. Um, and, it, and it's interesting as well, you know, John is absolutely right talking about the 1950s when it begins to open up. That's because there's a crisis in Ireland in the 1950s. You know, the population down south drops below 3 million. Um, the vision of Ireland as a, as a conservative, protected a society, economically protected and so on, is beginning to break down. And there's a serious question mark over whether the kind of experiment about independence is going to work. Is this sustainable? Uh, economically, you know, because the vision of the of the nationalists who had struggled for independence was that we would become, you know, free of the British yoke, we would suddenly become prosperous. By the 1950s, this is dying. I mean, De Valera's vision of small farms and small industries has died to death in the 50s. And they're beginning then to think, well, what do we do? The, what they think is we have to bring in foreign direct investment. We have to bring in investors. We have to engage in the world. We have to start to trade. So from the 50s, there's a quiet revolution amongst the conservative elite. They said, now we've got to ditch all the old ideas. We've got to start embracing the world. And I think it's interesting that the more we do that, the more Ireland begins to open up and the more the kind of the, the, uh, the, the, the established authorities are being questioned. But it still takes an awful long time. I mean, we only end involuntary immigration in the 1990s. I mean, the Celtic Tiger does come in the 1990s. That's where things really explode. And um, it's it's a it was a very slow process. Um, Fintan O'Toole has written a, a personal history, which has just been published from the time he was born in 1958, called "We Don't Know Ourselves," which is a wonderful uh, double entendre. Because on the one hand, in Ireland, if you're if you suddenly won the lottery, you say, "Oh, we don't know ourselves. We're we're on the pig's back." But we don't know ourselves also means literally we don't know ourselves. We don't understand ourselves at all. And I think that's the other parallel. Uh, to a very censorious, strict official ideology is that people know it doesn't work, um, but it kind of blocked a candid look at what we were, what we had inherited. I mean, even to this day, um, colonialism is a taboo word. We in Ireland don't discuss colonialism. We don't discuss the colonial inheritance we have, you know? Um, there's a lot of uh, issues around healthcare. Nobody really talks about the fact that our healthcare service comes from the Catholic Church's dominance of the, of the health. I sometimes joke, we should have got our independence in the 1950s when the NHS had been set up. We, we wouldn't have had the problems. But there was, a, there was a lack of candor in the dialogue because the official, the, the official notions of state and family propriety were so oppressive that you couldn't have the kind of candid conversation that is at the heart of Joyce. Joyce is looking things absolutely directly, you know? 
Uh, William Burroughs was once asked why he called his book Naked Lunch. He says, so that you look at exactly what's at the end of your fork. I mean, this is what Joyce does. He, there is no, he just looks directly at everything. But as John rightly made the point, Joyce isn't just looking at the surface of things. He penetrates very deeply. And sometimes when you read Joyce, he uses these uh, uh, liturgical terms. I have to go looking up the dictionary. What is this? It's a particularly, it's a, it's a church instrument. Or a, it's, a, it's a particular belief. He knows this stuff. And he, he throws it off very lightly. But you can see when he talks about Moses Mamamides, or you, he, he just throws this stuff in there, even from his historical grasp. I mean, he makes these odd not odd, but 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 very arcane references that are all historically accurate, even going back into the medieval period. He really knows his stuff, you know, um, in terms of trying to catch him out on something that's wrong, whether it's about the liturgy, the theology, the Irish history, the Irish language, the mythology. The reason why he's able to play such fun and games with all of these things, like he does in the, the famous scene with the citizen, um, is because he knows this stuff absolutely inside and out. He knows us in a way Joyce is one of the few people who could actually say, uh, yes, we do know ourselves. I know. I know. We may not know ourselves, but I know because he does know. And, it, and, and that's, again, I think one of the reasons why he's constantly fascinating, because it's you're literally mining deep into. The, the, honestly, the soul of the nation in many ways, he really so, does understand this. Joyce, an all knowing genius, John McCord. <laughs> I wouldn't go that far, but then. Um... I think it's true. He 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 does know the soul of the nation, and he knew how the soul of the nation had been affected, and if you like, doubly colonized. You know, he said that the, the harder power to kind of get rid of would would not be so much being being under the the weight of of British rule, but under the weight of Rome rule. I mean, he says that that's when Ireland will be free, when it finally manages to emerge in an adult way to come to terms with its Catholic inheritance. We haven't done that yet, by the way. Um, you know, we've had a very strong anti-Catholic reaction, but we, we have to, I think, do a lot more to come to terms with what Catholicism meant for Ireland in both a good and in a bad sense, because Catholicism gave us a huge amount. Um, but of course, in particularly um, in, in the dark years of the 20th century, it, that, that amount came at an enormous and an unacceptably high cost. But there are two sides of it. I mean, Joyce was very grateful for his Catholic education. At the same time, he was aware, and I think he hints all over the place at the abuses of some of those religious figures. I mean, it's it's written in the lines. It's written between the lines, if you like, of 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 what we read. The other thing, I mean, Joyce's book is full of learning, and but if it was only full of learning, it would be it would be dull and boring. Uh, the beauty of Joyce's book is that it's also full of the popular culture of the day. It, it's so resonant of the of the Dublin and the voices of Dublin of the time um, and the scene that that Eamon just mentioned, you know, the citizen scene, the Cyclops scene in Ulysses. I mean, that is just an extraordinary um, an extraordinarily real evocation of Dublin pub life at the time. Now, it's not a celebration of that life because it's it's blatantly aware of the limits of that kind of ultra masculine culture. So it both makes us laugh at it. But it also makes us step back and wonder about that kind of a world and, and the nationalism that was behind it there. I mean, uh, is that the best response we had at the time to, to British nationalism? Was it simply this reactive kind of a thing? Joyce, on the other hand, was trying to suggest something much deeper and more subtle, I think, through the character mainly of, of Leopold Bloom. Not that Joyce endorses Leopold Bloom. He's not a spokesman or anything like that. But there are other ways of, of, looking, of looking at the world. So... Joyce, certainly, I think, I think he did give us the epic of the nation. And we're still learning to read that epic, which is still why it's so popular. But we're also still learning to read our own nation and its past. And we're still very much coming to terms with that. I think, I think Ambassador McKee is entirely right in, in, in saying that. And the, as I said, the, the kind of double colonization that the country went through that Joyce so brilliantly dissects in his books. You both have referred to the tremendous changes that Ireland has undergone in the last 70 years. And from, you know, being a lay state and joining the European Union, and the abortion and the, uh, the whole question, all those questions, divorce. In your book, uh, John McCourt, you write that over, over that period, the people of Ireland were often far ahead of the government and the press 
in relation to those changes that had to come. And I wonder, was that the case with Joyce as well? Were the people more welcoming and understanding of Joyce than the established powers and uh, institutions? And certainly not in the first 50 years of the book's life. I don't think the people were pro-Joyce at all. I don't think they would have felt free to be um, you know, supportive of Joyce or what he was writing about. They'd have been afraid of getting a, a, a belt of a crozier or a visiting parish priest who, I mean, there is, I think I say it in the book, uh, somebody recounted the parish priest paying a visit and seeing a portrait of the artist in the book, on the bookshelf and just saying, I will take that now. That's not a proper book to have in a proper Catholic household. And um, so, you know, maybe occasionally there would have been people. And um, I think they were the people, those people who were, didn't feel at home in the Ireland of the time. Um, there were possibly more people read Joyce who had gone into exile than those who stayed as who stayed at home. And yet that's also not a simple thing because among the Irish American community in America um, and in, in the newspapers of the Irish American community, he, he was even more fiercely criticized than he was back at home. Um, so I'm not sure the people were ahead, but I think there were certain people who appreciated Joyce and they kept the flame alive, if you like. But it was also, don't forget, very hard to get a copy of Ulysses in Ireland. The book was never banned, but it didn't need to be banned because, I mean, basically um, the, the, the belief among the powers that were was there was no need to ban this book. Nobody was going to read it anywhere anyway. Uh, this was a book that was above people. It was above the common people. So there's nothing to worry about. So um, at the same time, if you wanted to get a copy of it up until the late 60s, um, even though it wasn't banned, it was very difficult to get one in a Dublin, in a Dublin bookshop, not to mention outside of Dublin. And if you were given it, you'd be given it in a brown paper bag and you'd keep you'd keep it kind of covered <laughs> up uh, as though you were taking home pornography or something like that. And um, so uh, it, it had this very shady life. Uh, it was counterfeit. It was it was something dangerous that could blow up in your hands. But to your really point, Dennis, on 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 change, it's absolutely your point is absolutely right. The change certainly on around abortion and, 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 and marriage equality, even in contraception is driven by incredibly brave individuals. Uh, people like Mary Robinson, you know, Nell McCafferty, the women's movement getting the train up to get the condoms in Belfast. These are individuals who say, we're not putting up with this. The change doesn't really, this change does not come from the government. The, gov the, the Irish society and government is very status quo orientated. Why? Because they've done very nicely, thank you very much. Uh, the people who aren't doing very nicely basically have to leave. But you get these individuals here and there that eventually come together and they challenge in the courts and through action, direct action, um, these, uh, these uh, Catholic uh, impositions on, 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 our, on our policy, social and otherwise. So these are lone individuals. They're the ones, very often women, who are saying this is really not good enough. Eventually then you get survivors of institutional abuse in the mother and baby's homes and so on coming forward and being very brave about saying what actually happened, you know? Uh, a lot of this was aired on the, the famous late, late television show on, on a Saturday evening with Gay Byrne um, and some really searing uh, personal accounts of what happened. So it is about kind of individuals who are saying not reading this is not good enough and challenging a very status quo orientated political system to make these changes happen. And eventually, you know, it's, it, it's hard work. Eventually it does roll forward. And then suddenly we seem to we emerge in the 80s and 90s into a very different Ireland. Mm -hmm. um, and coincidentally, of course, we have the peace process. We have the Celtic Tiger. Uh, Irish confidence suddenly zooms in the 1990s, you know. Um, and, and taking up John's point, very in a, in a similar way, there were always advocates for Joyce, kind of lone individuals who are keeping the, the torch alive, as it were. And eventually society catches up with them. So the progress in our society has been driven by some very courageous people, um, uh, individuals who push out in all kinds of different ways to eventually demolish a lot of the restraints and create a different society. But I think John, John's point is right. We still haven't really, as a society, interrogated all of what happened in the past. We're not quite sure where we're going, to be honest. I think there's a, there's a missing bit there. Um, so um, we're, it's going to be really interesting over the next few years to see how that debate goes. Um, but in whatever way that debate goes, Joyce is going to still be incredibly relevant to that, you know. Yeah, and I think I think Joyce Joyce's work was quite important for a lot of those individuals you're talking about, Eamon. I think they went yeah. to him and they found a place of freedom there 
you know, yeah. and even even a model of someone who was willing to go against the status quo at a huge personal cost, you know, Absolutely. and, um, yeah, and yeah. They, they followed that example, if you like. And and you're right that the politicians came in at the end when it was safe to do so and embrace change when change had already quasi de facto taken place. No. Yeah. 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 And, and the other point, I think we should remember this. You think Nora Barnacle, for example. She runs off with Joyce and doesn't marry them. She barely knows the guy. She she heads off into this wide world with a guy she said, I don't know if he's a genius, but he's the maddest man I ever met or something to that effect. She's an incredibly um, wild individual. She goes, literally, more or less, joins hands with him, jumps into the darkness of the outside world. She has no idea what's going on. She is clearly a rebel. She said, I, I don't want to live in this society in this kind of way. Um, and, you know, when you look at Joyce's career, uh, there are so many women who support him, you know, Sylvia Beach and all kinds of sponsors um, who support him. And clearly Joyce, when he writes to these women and he talks to these women, he's talking to them as equals. You know, his aunt Josephine, for example, he writes these long letters, he wants her approval. He gets very disappointed when they don't like uh, Finnegan's Wake. They think he's gone off the deep end. But he really values their opinion. He, he relies on them um, for moral support, intellectual support, uh, financial support, publications. The amount of women that uh, Joyce kind of recruited to his campaign, as it were, are, is in, quite incredible because I think they recognized in Joyce somebody who was saying something different than what they were living under, which was a very you know, male patriarchy which kept them down. I think it's also fascinating that Joyce picks a Jew, a pacifist Jew, to be his main character, who not only doesn't get outraged that his wife is having a, is going to have a fling that afternoon, he goes off and facilitates it and forgives her. I mean, he's most so in, in that way he's a very he's you know Joyce is, is again it's a stroke of genius to pick somebody like a Bloom a Bloom like like Leopold Bloom as his main character. You know, and, and you see this in, in Ulysses, the anti-Semitism, the fact that he's an outsider, you know. Um, but I go back to that point, you know, he ends the Ulysses with, with you know, he gives, he gives the final platform in Ulysses to, to Molly Bloom, you know. So Joyce, again, uh, very much on, on John's point about being a kind of a comfort and reference point for, for women in particular, you know, they, they supported him all his life and, and were key people to him. And, and Nora is emerging now, there's a novel, based around Nora. Nora is emerging as people are recognizing, you know, just what an iconoclastic figure she was, how brave she was, and, and how admirable she was, you know. Oh, I, I agree with that. And I mean, Ulysses wouldn't have been published without these various women. I mean, firstly, in serial form and in the little review, you know, and they, they were sued and persecuted over, prosecuted, sorry, not persecuted, prosecuted over their publication. Well, they might have felt persecuted. <laughs> well, they were a bit of both, weren't they? But um, I think there's also in that, you no, know, apart from the, the importance that Joyce gives to um, writing against a very patriarchal kind of uh, structure, structured society, he also, in Ulysses, of course, gives the last word, and it's quite a long word to, to Molly Bloom. Um, and I don't believe that's a kind of a tag on or an addendum or a correction for not having into, into because all we've heard all the way through the book are these male voices for the, for the most part. And then suddenly there's this, this extraordinary change of, of gear in that last chapter. And the whole world is seen from the point of view of, of Molly Blue and the world is turned up and it's tur turned over. It's, it's a very different view. Now, we do see things that are in common with Leopold's way of looking at things, but um, we're left with her with, uh, with her very affirmative vision of the world, very inclusive vision of the world, um, and this extraordinary rendition of her, of, of this female voice, which owes so much, of course, to, to Nora mm -hmm. herself. And um, so I think that's extraordinary. The other thing I think, in terms of the Dublin of today, you know, in terms of uh, Leopold Bloom being, being Jewish and his family coming from Hungary and, you know, coming as, as exiles and emigrants into Ireland, like they are very much a herald of the Ireland that was to come a hundred years later. I mean, Joyce in, in Dubliners creates this paralyzed, closed city with no space. It's very constrictive. When we get to, to Ulysses, it's much more of a celebration of the city. I mean, it's, it's also very critical, but it is a celebration of, 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 of a capital city. And there's a strange emphasis put on many foreign figures within the novel. Um, you know, even some a lot of the names, Dubidat and Nanetti, the mayor, and Bloom himself, and Moses Glugatz, who comes from 
from Budapest. It's almost as if Joyce was playing up these foreign elements in the city and trying to trying to point to you know an opening, um, a breaking of the narrow-minded view of looking at Ireland. And and of course he wouldn't have believed, I think, the Ireland that has taken shape today, where you know the the presence of so many um, people working and living in Ireland who weren't born there. It's just extraordinary. After centuries of of continuous emigration and drain, now finally. We're in a position to be able to absorb all of these people who have who are the new Irish, whatever you want to call them, and um, who've given and are giving so much to our society. And I think I wouldn't underestimate the role they have had also in changing the society and making it more open. And you know, they don't have that burden of the Catholic history that so many in Ireland had. They just mm -hmm. it means very little to them. Yeah, no, absolutely right in terms of the Jewish contribution to Dublin life. I mean. We basically have lit back Jews coming from Lithuania who, who, were, who formed the communities in Dublin and Cork. The great joke was that when they were on the boat to New York, the ship stopped in at Cork and they heard the guy in his Cork accent saying, you're in Cork, you're in Cork. And they thought he said, you're in New York. And they all got off. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, the, no, but the reality was the Jews in Dublin uh, form a very cohesive uh, 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 community around Clam Castle Street. They start off as peddlers. And then within a generation, they're accountants and doctors and they're moving out to the houses in Rathdar and Mines, which you can kind of get echoes of that from, from Joyce's book. But by the 1950s, it's the, 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 the Jews of Dublin are the impresarios who are bringing Danny Kaye and people like this from Hollywood and from London into the Gaiety Theatre. And you know, Dublin entertainment life in Dublin in the 1950s is solely down to the number of Jewish um, impresarios. They all contribute to this intellectual ferment and, and, and uh, to the extent that there was any life in Dublin at the time that's demonstrated, you know, bringing in international talent, it's coming from those Jews. Now, the Jewish community then fades because after the Second World War, um, international Jewish communities begin to band, bind together after the, over the end of the influence of the Holocaust. So a lot of them, well, a lot of the Dublin Jews would have gone to Manchester, for example, which becomes a huge community for Jewish people. So there's uh, when I was ambassador in Israel, I came across those who had come to Israel and so on. Uh, but but I think John is right. John is pointing to a Dublin that's actually very cosmopolitan, and it's partly cosmopolitan because of these people going in. It's also partly cosmopolitan because the British Army is there, and you've got all of this mix of people. You've got the British Army, you've got the Lord Lieutenant, the Crown's representative, you've got you know plenty of Protestants and Catholics are beginning to feel the power. This is the other thing that you can see in in Ulysses. The Catholic middle class is finding its voice in the short stories and in and there, you know, the struggles around Parnell. It's a huge crisis with Parnell and and, and how Parnell, the, the crisis around Parnell splits Dublin. But this is how the Dublin middle class um, is is finding their political voice. And of course, Joyce himself and in his life, he has gone his life as a, as a young man because his father is spending all the money. They're sliding down. So he's actually getting the, it's like an escalator down through the layers of Catholic Dublin. He's going down, 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 down through all the layers. It's like a tour for him of what this whole society vertically is like. It's, it's quite an astonishing life. And he always really admires his father. His father, I think, John, you mentioned earlier, his father, not, not a particularly, re, uh, he's a bit of a reprobate, to be honest, you know, but, <laughs> loved him, but they still love him, you know, and, and, he, and of course he absorbed an awful lot of Irish culture from his father, his father's great singer, raconteur and so on. But Joyce is exploring all levels of this kind of Catholic experience uh, through his, the social and economic decline. And yet that social and economic decline that he experiences never, it never phases Joyce at all. Joyce is always seen as the coming man. Everybody regards him as special. His Aunt Josephine, his mother, his father. Everybody he meets from a very early age sees Joyce as special. He grows up with this confidence that he is destined for something. And what's great about Joyce is that he just decides, well, what I'm going to be great for is me, a pen and a piece of paper. I'm going mm -hmm. to do something astonishing. I'm not going to be a politician or a businessman or whatever. That's what he decides to do. And again, that's intellectually, that's audacious. He is staking... The significance of his life on his talent, what he's going to say, what he's going to put out there. He's got this incredible compulsion to put everything out there. You know, he's he's and it's not just he's not just memorizing stuff because he's actually using it to shape this incredible vision of, of, of Dublin that he wanders around and takes us with him in, in Ulysses, you know. So yeah, I think he I think he, he is a harbinger, he's definitely a harbinger of what's coming. I um 
you know, I, I think about um, that 100, that 100 years and, and what uh, John McCourt has told us in his book, uh, Consuming Joyce, just published, of course. Um, I, I'm tempted to ask, well, what does this 100th anniversary, this centenary, what does it mean to the Irish? What does it mean to the Irish state and government? What does it mean to the Irish acad academy and the body of, of critics? And, and those are, you know, three large areas. But for the, the academic Ireland, John McCourt, what does this 100-year anniversary mean? Well, it means a lot of things to a lot of people. I think for many, it means it's... it's um, <laughs> it's also, uh, as I keep saying, the year that we have to commemorate and come to terms with the Civil War, 1922. So one thing, Joyce provides a little bit of light entertainment, if you like, um, when we don't have to consider that. Um, for the academics, I, I do genuinely think Irish academics are finally taking kind of center stage in Joyce studies, uh, having been on the fringes for decades having not wanted to do the work or not being able to do the work for various reasons. And, you know, there are, there are many books, finally, the first book by an Irish academic in an English department in an Irish university on Joyce didn't come out until 1996. And that was Emer Nolan, James Joyce and Nationalism from uh, Maynooth. Um, so that's quite amazing if you think about it. Now, this year, I don't know how many books have come out in Ireland, but it's certainly a half a dozen and maybe more. But it's certainly more than that. It's probably a dozen. Um, and now mainstream Irish critics feel very much at home working with Joyce. Now, what I wouldn't like is for Joyce to become too mainstream, because I continue to think that Joyce remains a very radical writer who should challenge us as much today as he did 100 years ago, because yes, lots of change has changed in Irish society, but there's still lots that's wrong in Irish society. So I wouldn't want to make him too comfortable. He's not a coffee table book. So, you know, that's, I also enjoy the whole Bloomsday thing in Ireland, in Dublin. Um, it's a lot of fun. People get dressed up in costumes and they celebrate Joyce. Um, it's been criticized as being a kind of a commercialization of Joyce. I think we have to be careful about that. However, if it can lead people to actually opening the book, then it's probably all worthwhile. But let's be careful that we don't deprive him of his meanings. Don't turn him into a secular saint without actually understanding why, we're, why we give him so much attention. I think that's, that's pretty important. But I'm very encouraged. I mean, I've led a reading group for the embassy in Rome. The last, we're, I think we're in chapter 15 now. And um, we've been reading every week since 2nd of February, and we'll finish Ulysses by uh, the 16th of June. I know there's a similar group doing that in, in Dunleary, in a yacht club. There's 50 of them that meet every week. Um, so lots and lots of, uh, you know, what we call rather facetiously ordinary readers are taking on Joyce, and they're putting in the necessary investment, because he's not the easiest of reads. Um, and I don't think there's any problem in saying that, but he's a writer who pays back in spades if you put the time in, you know, and if you're willing to be disrupted as a reader at the end of each chapter by finding yourself in a different style, in a different technique, in a different world in the next chapter of the book, the 18 chapters or episodes, each of which has its own style, that kind of disorientation, some people find a little bit off-putting, but it really is worth, you know, persevering. Um, so I think Joyce um, is very much center stage in, in literary criticism in Ireland today. I think he's been reevaluated by many people who wouldn't have looked at him. And I think he's been read by all ages as well. I think there's a genuine um, engagement with him. Um, and of course, I mean, the Irish government says, you know, various Irish governments really since, since about 2000 have invested hugely in the Joyce heritage that we have. They have, if you like, put their money where their mouth is because, you know, he is. But it, took, it took them a while. It took, took them a while from your book. Well, it took us about obvious. 80 years to do anything. Yeah. But finally. Yeah. And again, there, there's, it's very frustrating because, you know, the first year we have an international symposium in Dublin is the year 7 Eccles Street. Leopold and Molly Bloom's house is torn down and Demolition Ireland, a Demolition Dublin deals with that and it's gone, gone forever. We're left with the door, probably, and some strips of wallpaper. I mean, that should be one of the key literary landmarks in the country and it's gone. Today, right. we're celebrating it much more openly, much more enthusiastically, and yet the House of the Dead, the house of, um, on Usher's Island, 
which is the location of probably the finest short story in the English language, which should be, you know, the equivalent of, I don't know, um, in any other country, I think that house would be saved for posterity. And it would be a, a place of pilgrimage also, almost, because it is a place of pilgrimage. Lots of visitors go there and they, and they come away wondering why there's weeds growing as you go up into it and why the windows are falling down and why it's just left derelict. And, and there's a lack of connection there, you know, um, which I still today find very hard to come to terms with. It seems to me like a no brainer to, to, to acquire that house and, and turn it into, um, into something special for Joyce, a house of the dead museum. So much of what we've done for Joyce has been done through volunteers. The Joyce Tower out in Sandy Cove, wonderful location. It's kept open because solely because of volunteers. There's several hundred of them that work there 365 days a year keeping it open. Without them, it would be closed and abandoned. And, um, and yet it's a huge site of interest for visitors to the country. Sorry, I've gone on too long. <laughs> no, can I just pick, sorry, Dennis, just to pick up on one thing. Yes, and, of and, course. And, um, what John mentioned about the embassy reading group that he has in Rome. And that, I think we need to a shout out for uh, the kind of diaspora groups around, including Canada, by the way, who have for years um, have, uh, you know, focused on, 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 on Joyce, like, in, like the Montreal Blues Day Festival. Uh, there's, a, there's a Joyce Association here in Ottawa, and all through Canada, we have had people who have been connected to each other through a love of Joyce. And what I found, what I find, one of them said to me, um, and rather poignantly, as an immigrant from Dublin, she says, well, I'm, I am home when I read Joyce. If I'm homesick, I read Joyce. It brings me right back there. Um, and in a way, I think immigrant communities, and it's one of the features of immigration, that you do get a much clearer view of your society when you leave it. You know, and I think the immigrants who leave Ireland can cast their eyes back and say, I can't understand that more because our society is immersive and comfortable, but also claustrophobic and, and uh, occludes a deeper vision about what actually is going on in society. And for the same reason, Joyce leaves. You know, Joyce is yeah. not persecuted out of Dublin. He's deliberately leaving and joining uh, an intellectual European milieu in which he sees himself as a key figure. And in fact, that intellectual media immediately recognizes Joyce as a key figure. I mean, he becomes a leader wherever he goes intellectually, you know. But yeah, I think the, the Irish immigrants, you know, uh, sustain themselves and sustain Joyce. And it's, and it's wonderful to see it too. Uh, the other thing I would ask you, Ambassador McKee, because picking up on what John McCourt said about the, you know, the late coming and the, mm. the, the neglect of the Joycean sites is, what does the hundredth anniversary mean to the Irish state, to the Irish government? Well, I think it, I, I think certainly we're very happy to the Irish government is very happy to support it. We've got a lot of support from Department of Foreign Affairs headquarters uh, to uh, to support the celebration of it. Um, and yeah, there's a, there's an element of of promotion, but I think there's also an element of pride around uh, Ulysses and the hundred years and, and and the fact that it's it's such a a, a landmark in world literature. That's absolutely true. The other thing, you know, in terms of the, the foundation of the state being coincidental, I think it's a bit more problematic. Um, we're much more comfortable and have been much more comfortable celebrating the centenary of 1916. We had a huge official celebration back in Ireland in 2016. We had a program outreaching to the schools uh, where, we, where we had the Irish Army presenting the proclamation and the flag. Um, we had a big celebration in Dublin, big official parade. Well, I mean, the people, the government and people really got behind uh, 2016. It's much more muted around 1922. I think there's a, it's still a bit conflicted about, you know, the state partition, where we're at at the moment. Uh, the civil war, as, as John rightly says, is kind of rumbling around there. I think 1916 is so iconic um, and is seen to be the foundation of the modern state. And that's true in many ways, not in all ways, but certainly true in many ways. But I think for, for 1922, um, it's still uncertain how we, well, what, how do we make sense of all of this? So it's much more muted, whereas 1916 is very, very clear. It's, it's much more muted uh, around the centenary of, our, of, our, of our, the actual foundation of the state, because don't forget the state. Uh, in 1922 is formed on the basis of a treaty that generates a civil war. 
are quite sure um, what to make of all of this. So it's, it's, it's kind of interesting. So I think there's more energy in the celebration of USA's than there is in the celebration of the foundation of the state, oddly enough. Which is odd, isn't it? Yeah. But <laughs> Although I, I think another, another, sorry, sorry, Dennis. No, it's quite, quite, I was going to say there, but there is a coincidence of the result of the election in the North uh, in, the, in the last week. Yeah, I mean, the election in the North, I think, you know, uh, back 24 years ago when we were negotiating the Good Friday Agreement, you know, we kind of did think we'd get a generation out of it. And, you know, we're coming up now next year, it'll be the 25th anniversary. Uh, the election up North was incredibly significant because the Nationalist Party, Sinn Féin, is now the largest party with uh, with uh, 20, what is it, 27 seats in, um, uh, out of 90 in the North, in, in, in Northern Ireland. That's quite, that's quite a change. Again, seeing it's not that it means unification is imminent, but it does mean it's taking a step forward in a way. So there's this, this kind of bubbling debate about unity and what it means and how much change it might mean when it happens, if it happens. But beyond the unity debate, I think it's actually, it's more proximate in the sense that how do we, how do we sustain a viable political uh, entity in Northern Ireland, a power share, how do we get back to power sharing? This is really problematic. Of course, it's all been thrown sideways by Brexit. Nobody could ever mention that, you know? Um, so yeah, the, the election in the North is, is a bit of a depth charge in terms of uh, where do we go from here? And we have to, keep, we have to keep, keep the process going. But I mean, throughout Irish history, the future is constantly changed. You know, when you imagine what the future is, it's, it's different. So <laughs> when the French Revolution happens, we imagined it, we certainly imagined a different future. The future was no sectarianism, no Catholic Protestant at center altogether. In the 1800s, when Britain abolishes our parliament, there's suddenly a different future. You know, we could have imagined if the parliament had been sustained that eventually Catholics would have been admitted into that parliament by the 1830s, 40s, or at the latest, the 50s, we would have had Catholics and Protestants in a parliament probably would have taken us in a direction and not being partitioned. Uh, our future, as I said earlier, was then Canada. And then 1916 creates a different future and then partition does. Um, so our future is constantly changing, you know? Um, and in a way, Joyce is the only fixed point we have. And, and it's a fixed point because it's so human. It's, it's such a, as John said at the outset, it's such a human intimate story for all of the intellectual heft and his knowledge, it's still the human experience you know, moving through life uh, on, a, on a single day. In your book, John McCourt, you mention that in your discussion of how the Irish critics and literary analysis came late to the game, despite plainly misguided readings of the book or of Ireland by European and American academics and analysts. And I wonder, can you, Expand on that. Give us one of those plainly misguided readings that that you come upon. Well, it's not necessarily that they were misguided readings. It's that they were very complicated readings, often written in highly academic language for a very small audience in order to, you know, um, to get a job in an academic institution full of literary theory that was gobbledygook to the kind of Joyce reader that was regular in Dublin. So you get Donna McDonough reviewing a book and he, he prefaces the review by writing books about books about books are a bore. Now he's gone and given us one more, something like that. And then he <laughs> proceeds to review the book, which he is, of course, buried in the opening sentence. So the, 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 there was a lot of earnest criticism done by a lot of American critics, um, many of whom did great work, by the way. And without them, I don't think Joyce would be where he is today. But a lot of it wasn't terribly readable or a lot of fun. And a lot of them, and it's understandable, got tripped up in the complications of, of Irish history and Irish political history, which is incredibly complicated and difficult. And we're only coming to terms with that ourselves. You know, even the whole world around Parnell and then Redmond and then moving into the, the next phase and towards 1916, it's full of landmines. It's incredibly easy to make mistakes. And the Irish critics relished a mistake and they'd hone in on the mistake rather than on the overall, maybe a, a pretty good book. And um, so th this, this was an element. And they, they, they believed that, they, that these other critics were making Joyce more difficult than he needed to be. They were adding a layer of difficulty rather than you know, being a kind of a filter to make the reading of Joyce easier. I think the, the fact that um, 
um, it became almost an industry in the in the weekend newspapers in Ireland to have a go at these critics, also critics of, of, of Yeats and of any other Irish writer. Um, it would, the belief was that you could only read Dub you could only read Ulysses if you were from Dublin. Otherwise, how could you possibly understand the Cyclops episode, which is, of course, nonsense, because nationalism exists everywhere. Prejudice exists everywhere. Decency and justice and those themes that are so important to Joyce exist everywhere. So, I mean, they have their local setting in Joyce's Dublin. But I mean, what makes the book universal is 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 that these are universal themes. He just happens to locate them in the city that he knew so well that he looked at from the distance, what he calls the safe side of distance from exile. That gave him the, the perspective that he needed. Um, so, you know, I'm not going to single out any one American critic who wrote a book that was, <laughs> was, was off, uh, not even remotely. It was just a bit of a sport among Irish intellectuals who who didn't want to do the hard work. Good of you to put so you're just on a point. I think American academia, academics were much more willing to embrace Joyce as an iconoclastic writer, a, a writer who was going to break the rules of language in a way that I think English academics have never uh, opened up to because it's their English language. They're much more orthodox about it. They don't like to see the rules broken. Whereas, you know, Joyce is writing from within a society that has spoken Irish, that has got a Hiberno-English. He's prepared to just put down how people speak on the page. And I think American academics are much more open to that. But I, that's just kind of a superficial impression I have. I don't know if John wanted to speak to that point. No, I, th I think that's right. I mean, I don't think um, in English academia embraced Joyce particularly at all. In, in Even now. Areas. Even now, he's he's not a major, he is a major figure, but he's... Uh, yeah, but there, it depends. Sometimes it takes just one academic in a university to create a kind of a movement, no, around around a writer. Um, but um, yeah, certainly I think a lot of the American critics were were Jewish, you know, like like Richard Elman, and I think they certainly identified with 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 Bloom. They they identified with that kind of a worldview, which was much more inclusive and you know open. Um, so there was a kind of a human identification with him as well, which lay behind some of their criticism. And the Irish Joycians just like making fun. I mean, there's the famous story, and we'll never know if it's true or not, that, of an interview that Flann O'Brien supposedly did with Joyce's father. And it was a fake, or probably was a fake. But the Hugh Kenner, the great American critic, took it to be real and quoted in his book several times. But it probably never happened. But it became <laughs> one of these sources. So they enjoyed setting people up who came to Dublin with the best of goodwill, trying to get to the bottom of stuff. And then they ran into somebody like Flann O'Brien, who just took, 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 took the piss, really, to, to, <laughs> put it, to put it very brutally out of them and um, waited for the book to come around so that they could then poke more fun, more fun at them. One thing I'd mention, I think, we talked about the Irish government and, and, and Joyce, and I think it's a bit of a mixed messaging. But uh, the, the role of Irish diplomats in, in understanding and helping Joyce uh, when he was alive was important. He connected with many of them. Um, I think there was a huge amount of goodwill. I think a lot of them were reading Joyce when people at home were not. You know, you see when Joyce dies in Zurich, the, the Irish representative there writes home to De Valera, who's Minister for Foreign Affairs, and asks, can he go to the funeral? And he's told, no, did he die a Catholic? Um, and then you see in the, 19, in the middle 60s when Hugh Leonard's play, um, Stephen D, adapted from um, a portrait of the artist, um, is going to be put on in Zurich. It's been a great success in Ireland already and in London and in New York, won a Tony Award. Um, the Irish ambassador writes home asking permission to somehow even go to see the play. And in the end, in order to be allowed to, to pr provide some money for such a thing, um, he says, if we don't do it, the British will. So, and of course, that's the only thing that creates a bit of movement in Dublin and suddenly it is sanctioned because, you know, where we weren't present, the British tended to appropriate Irish cultural figures like Joyce. So, um, you, you, I, you know, I'm 30 years out of the country now, but I've never seen anything in, in, among Irish diplomats other than great appreciation for Joyce and not simply, you know, exploitation of the name. But there's a genuine, uh, I think, respect and pride in what he has done. And so many of them have, have taken the trouble to read him, you know. So I think that's they're, they're ahead of the politicians in this. Although our Minister for Finance, Pascal O'Donoghue, I think has finished Ulysses this year quite publicly. <laughs> I've done it. Lockdown caused a lot of people to read things they wouldn't otherwise <laughs> have. Well, yeah. 
I wouldn't want to, to close this up without first asking you, John McCourt, to tell us just a little bit about the work that went into this book, the archival research. Is this, is this the work of a lifetime? I mean, the every you seem to have read everything in the last part that was written about Joyce in Ireland in the last hundred years. Well, I'm sure I haven't read everything. It's been a long time coming, this book, yeah. Um, I really felt that somebody needed to take a, a long look at the reception of Ulysses in Ireland, because I think it's a key, it's a key text. Um, and it tells us a lot about ourselves, how we have come to terms with it over generations. So in order to do that, all I could do was to try and yeah, ex do exactly what you said, to go through the newspapers, to go through the archives, to go through religious periodicals, to to focus in around times that were significant, you know, Joyce's own death, how was that commemorated or mentioned in, in, in publishing in Ireland, to try and look at Joyce in popular culture. And I began, I suppose, maybe 10 or 12 or 15 years ago to get, begin gathering material. And it was a very slow process when so much less was available on the internet. Now we have so much archival material available on the internet. It would have been much easier if I'd started two years ago. Instead, I started 15 years ago by, you know, going to the National Library, going to archives in the States and looking through these newspapers and frankly, doing a lot of word searches and, and also trying to look through people's biographies and their letters anywhere there was a kind of a mention of Joyce. So the book, luckily, I suppose, for the reader, you called it the book exhaustive. I hope it's not exhausting. It could have <laughs> been a lot more exhausting because it could have been an awful lot longer. But but Bloomsbury really put me under pressure to compress it into into the number of pages that are there. Because you know, people can only take so much information. And so it's representative of the kinds of stuff that was being written about Joyce, but certainly there's a lot more that you could say. So it's, I wouldn't say it's a life work, but I, I've been at it, I was tinkering at it for about 10 years, and then I really got stuck into it in the last two years. There's nothing like a deadline of a, a, a century <laughs> to focus the mind. And I really was determined to have it out in time for the 2nd of February and the 16th of June this year, because, um, you know, it just, I hope, provides some kind of a, of a reading of Joyce in Ireland, but also of a changing Ireland um, as seen through the way we reacted and react to Joyce today. So it's that kind of a, a, long, a long perspective that I try to give it. I, I'm really tempted to ask you about the Brendan Bayon quote for, in a speech in New York that I, that I found in, I think, in chapter six. I wonder if, could you tell us just briefly what Bayon said and what you think he meant? Um, you remind me of this one. I'm, I'm okay. Um, said, well, my interpretation of the quote is that Brendan Bain in the speech, the poet Brendan Bain in the speech, said in New York that all everyone in Ireland thinks they could have written that book, but the pubs were open too late and they kept them from it. Something like that. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's it. I mean, that's the, he, he's totally right. Um, that was again the idea that the, the people in Ireland knew better and that what he's talking about Richard Elman's great biography. And, um, and why he says Elman or Kelman or what's his name? Um, I mean, it was a play, it, it's an amazing document because he went to the James Joyce Society in New York, which had several hundred members in the 60s already and had been founded, uh, among others, by the other Irish poet, Paul Collum, who was, a, who was for you know half a century one of Joyce's greatest supporters, even though Joyce had pilloried him in Ulysses and called him, what do you call him? <laughs> um, and, and one of them. But um, Bean turned up in New York and, of course, was probably not that sober when he gave the talk. The talk was later published as a long playing, a long playing record. I have the record. And um, then some person, some American in the in the society then tried to write the transcript of what Bean had actually said in a very strong Dublin accent. I think Bean had huge respect for Joyce. I think he, he looked to him as a figure that he could follow because Bean was a very isolated figure in many ways, culturally in Ireland. He struggled for models to follow and Joyce was this liberating figure that he followed. And I think uh, he was not impressed by the, to, that easy condemnation of foreign criticism of Joyce. That, um, you know, if the Irish really wanted to just keep picking holes in Joyce criticism, then they should go out and do the book themselves. But like how many Irish books were drunk to death. I mean, we, we, we know that. And I think that's one of the other reasons Joyce left, um, that he, he might never have managed to do what he did had he stayed in Dublin. He might have been devoured by Dublin. I mean, it, it was very tough to, 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 to resist in the Ireland of the 40s and 50s and keep your freedom 
and have that sense of intellectual freedom to actually write what you wanted uh, without fear. Um, and um, a lot of them succumbed. A lot of them had very, very uh, intermittent careers, like Flann O'Brien is the great example of that. You know, one great novel in 1939 and then nothing until the 1960s, um, apart from his whole, um, all his newspaper columns, which are in themselves a wonderful contribution, but they're not, they're not Ulysses. I'm sure we could all sit here and listen to the two of you talk about Joyce and Ulysses and Ireland for another hundred years. Uh, but I, I'm going to have to close this and I'm going to close it with a, an, an answer, a question that you can answer as briefly as you want or as, or as long as you want. We've had a hundred years. There's the apocryphal story that Joyce said, I'm writing this novel so professors can write about it for a hundred years um, or something to that effect. So. What does the next hundred years hold for Ulysses and Joyce? Ambassador McKee, with you, can we start? Uh, well, just first of all, to, to, to commend John as, as, as a kind of a, a leading intellectual, and, and, and I look forward to, to getting his book and reading it. And uh, I'm sure it's, it, it's going to be thrilling as well as exhaustive. Uh, but it, it, it's obviously a, a great contribution to the canon of new thinking around Joyce and collecting that story and seeing how we did react to it, which I think will be a bit of a guide to how we react in the future. I, I, I mean, my sense for the next 100 years for Joyce is he will go from strength to strength. I, I, I think, you know, we're, we're in Ireland, there's a, we're divesting ourselves of the constraints and stereotypes of historical identity. You know, we are in a way waking up from the nightmare of history. Um, and I think that process continues. I mean, and to go back uh, briefly, in the in the peace process and negotiations, you know, we changed Articles two and three of our constitution. We didn't claim Northern Ireland as our territory de jure anymore. We went back and we said, no, no, actually, Northern Ireland will only change with consent. This is about people. It's a message from John Hume that uh, partition isn't the problem; it's the division between people and their identities. And and that actually quite was was quite a was quite a significant move uh, and and unlocked the peace process in many ways. But it could only happen when people have confidence in themselves and they're not just clinging to identity and stereotypes and so on. So I, I, I think that's where we're going. I think we've been, we're, we are now at a process where, and it began only really in the 1990s, where Ireland is embracing all the different forms of Irish identity. These were all kind of cut away. We're now actually looking at the Irish, Irish people who joined the British Army, joined the Connacht Rangers and the Royal Dublin Fusiliers, we're beginning to embrace the Imperial Irish, the story of the Irish, I mean, um, and, uh, and unionist identity. So this em embracing of all these different, of this kind of rich texture of our history, which was simplified hugely by, by 1916. And, 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 and um, you know, the, the terrible beauty that Yates talked about was the simplification involved. Ireland's embracing its complexity. And I think, you know, Joyce would, would be delighted in that. That is the momentum. So I think Joyce just becomes more and more relevant, and hopefully we'll see him on the, the school syllabus. John, record the next hundred years. Well, I mean, I I I think Joyce is by now uh, our most important cultural icon, if you like, um, and that's not to do down W. V. Yeats or or Beckett or any of the other figures who are also hugely important. But I mean, I really do think he's got a long future ahead of him. I mean, Dante is, we celebrated in Italy the 700 years uh, last year, and he's as relevant as he ever was to Italy and to the Italian language. Um, so that's extraordinary. I see no reason why Joyce can't, you know, be in that kind of company into the future. Um, as, as the ambassador talked about, you know, the nightmare of history that we're still coming to terms with, you know, and the history coming round. I mean, here we are in 2022, coming out of the of the um, COVID pandemic coming and, and living in another war in Europe. Ulysses was published in 1922. The Spanish flu pandemic was, was around and we were in a war in Europe. And it all feels, it's not the same, of course it's not, but there are remarkable echoes of a hundred years ago. So many of the things that Joyce, I think, writes for in his book, and I think he writes for exactly what Eamon said, complexity. The, ne the necessary necessary complexity of identity, um, decency, justice, consent, these ideas that he makes us think about in the book, um, the importance of everyday life, the quotidian. Um, you know, in, in, you see that when you look at what's happening in Ukraine, 
you know, when you see ordinary life just being stripped away, literally being mowed down. And you would see that Joyce saw that happening in Europe as well. And what does he write about? He writes about 24 hours in the day of an ordinary, decent city like Dublin. And I mean, that's again, we're back to the importance of the human. As to what will happen to Joyce with the critics, well, that's anyone's that's anyone's guess. But I'm no doubt that we're going to keep finding new things to say about him because he will become and he does become relevant to each new generation. I mean, and at the moment, one of the big things is Joyce and issues of sustainability and climate change. And people are finding all sorts of ways of reading Ulysses through those keys. So there's always new ways and new generations who will surprise us when they come to Joyce. And he is a bit of a you know, uh, a big quarry into which you can continue to mine. And I think he'd be pleased to think that uh, 100 years from now, um, there'll be there'll be another group of people having a, a conversation like this to talk about the importance of his works. We always need to wake up, don't we? Yeah. Juan McCourt, author of Consuming Joyce, 100 Years of Ulysses in Ireland, and Ambassador Emin McKee, Ambassador to Canada from the Republic of Ireland. It's been a fabulous time talking to you and listening to both of you. Thank you so much for taking part today in this Festival Bloomsday Montreal event. Thank, Thank you, you for having us. Yeah. Yeah, most enjoyable. Thank you. And lovely to meet you, Eamon. And yeah, Dennis, likewise, John. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hopefully in person one of these years. Yeah. 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 Yeah, no, look forward to your book because uh, there's the, like the element thing is still, I mean, it's still a, such a brilliant book. Um, but Absolutely. I mean, just as a, I mean, the, the, the sources, the detail, the scholarship are fantastic, you know, but uh, your sounds fantastic in terms of just the, the, all the sources that you've checked out, what was the official reaction? And we're, it's, it's still unfolding. I mean, the, um, I, I, you know, that came up a couple of times in the conversation, governance in Ireland is a, is a very problematic issue. I mean, why, why the, 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 but inability to manage Dublin. Why, mm. why Joyce, Joyce and landmarks are just demolished in the name of developers. And um, I, I think it's, it's a failure of governance. It's a failure. We, we never questioned what we inherited in 1922. We inherited the colonial system. Well, the problem in Ireland, there's no, there's no there, there. there there's, <laughs> there. There's power without authority. Nobody's got authority. Uh, yeah. And so the system is incredibly conservative, uh, you know, there was a, a story I came across which was quite unbelievable. De Valera, when he came to power in 1932, he won the election on the basis of the land annuities, that we shouldn't be borrowing money to pay off the landlords, and he wanted to solve the problem. And uh, he talked to uh, a guy called Jones, who was in the, the Dominion office in London, and he said, oh, no, we came up with a deal with the previous government. There's a paper on the financial final financial arrangement. And you have it in, uh, you have it over there. So De Valera called the Secretary General of the Department of Finance, J.J. McGilligan, to, to get the paper. McGilligan said, you can't have it. <laughs> but he wouldn't give it to him on the basis that uh, there are certain things that uh, politicians are best kept away from. Um, and they never, he, I mean, De Valera was Attorney General to try and get the paper. He never, I don't think he ever got it. And uh, it's astonishing <laughs> that this, and then it, this ends up in, a, in an economic war with Britain. But when you think of it, could you imagine the Lise Palace saying to a senior official, give the president the paper, and the guy says, no, it would never have happened, you know? Um, and it's a small story about lack of authority, you know? Mm. And uh, to this day, I think ministers come into power and think I'm a minister now, this is great. And then suddenly realize, Christ, I've no authority whatsoever. They, <laughs> I have to mediate between all these different power centers, you know? So it's, it's, it's um, I'll finish with this kind of funny story. We, we, uh, with the Celtic Tiger years, 1990s onwards, we used to get these delegations from Uruguay and Asian countries coming to find out how we created Celtic Tiger. And they'd go around and somebody say, well, we brought in free education in the 1960s. Oh, well, we worked, we, we managed the budget pretty well and we invested a bit in investment. And one delegation, when they were leaving Ireland, said, our bastards won't tell us. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but we didn't kind of know how we did it, you know? So, yeah, but we kind of make our way. We get there eventually. You know, yeah, well, it sounds not unlike the Italian situation. I remember when Bertie Ahern was Taoiseach and Silvio Berlusconi was the prime minister here. There was a meet, there was something in the Irish embassy, and, and our prime minister, our Taoiseach, um, Bertie Ahern, was asked seemingly by, by Berlusconi how many people are in the depart your department, the department of the Taoiseach. He wouldn't have called it that, obviously. But I don't know what the answer was 200 people, maybe. And, and, um, 
Berlusconi said, well, there's 5,000 in my department and they're all working against me. <laughs> <laughs> in that case, sometimes the public service, it does, it does a lot of good public service. But that's, that's, a, that's another one. Um, oh, well, there's, there's a, something to be said, though, for the universality of the Irish experience. I mean, the, the Catholic Church in Quebec and the, the respect for historical monuments in Canada and in Quebec. So many of these have parallels, I think, and the, and the fact that people really don't know the, what really happened in their history. So many of these things have parallels in so many places. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think that's right. I mean, I think, you know, constitutionally, Canada is still a work in progress. I mean, you know, um, the, the power of the provinces, the weakness of federal government, um, you know, it, 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 it's kind of interesting. You, I, I think it reached an interesting constitutional settlement in 1867, but it stopped kind of there, you know. Um, but the other interesting parallel is that Darcy, Thomas Darcy McGee, who was such an influence on 1867, he decided that Canada needed to be run uh, based on the model of, of British rule in Ireland and doing the exact opposite. You know, so uh, where Ireland was being ruled autocratically with indifference from London and with division and so on, he said, no, we have to do the exact opposite in Canada. Devolve democracy, respect for human rights, respect for identity, compassionate country, you know. Um, so Canada is an interesting model like that. But, uh, Canada is a model, they say, which uh, doesn't work in theory, but only works in practice. I, I think that's right, actually. Yeah. And it's very like Ireland in many ways, because it's a very siloed system, but they say, if you know somebody, you'll get it done. <laughs> like, you have to know somebody. I say Canada is the world's largest village, because everybody seems to know everybody else. You know? <laughs> Everyone has come through. Everyone's a friend of Bloomsday Montreal, that's for sure. Good, <laughs> good, good, good. Kevin, are you still with us? Kevin, come on in and say goodbye to our friends and our guests after we've... He'll, he'll tell you he loved it. And Kathleen loved it too. Okay, well, be, before I, I say anything else, I'd like to pick up on something that John McCourt was talking about, about Joyce knowing um, religion better than most people. And uh, I don't know if this is an apocryphal story or if it's really true, but he, he was very uh, versed in religion. And so he looked at the four gospels and he noticed that they didn't agree with each other. And he was a stickler for accuracy. So he decided that um, he was going to write something that would be extremely accurate. And so, what he decided to do was to write Ulysses. And everyone knows that he kept writing home to get the exact details of everything that ended up in the book. And so um, I like to think of this in religious terms as the epistle of James to the Hibernians, <laughs> as a challenge to the people of Ireland to reform or to, to, to grow, to advance to what they have become. But as, as you were saying, things are constantly evolving and things constantly need to be updated and changed. And that's why probably people still like to read him today. Anyway, for my part, I felt extremely privileged to be able to sit in and listen to all of what was said this morning. I thank you very much for spending the time with us. And as I said at the beginning, I think this is going to be one of the highlights of Festival Blooms Day, Montreal's 11th edition. The edition, which as Mr. Joyce would say, the edition of Start Over, we're number 11. We're taking on a new life. Thank you very much. And thanks, Kevin, for everything you do and all your volunteers and supporters. I mean, that, that's, you know, a, an embassy is nothing without, without people like you and your volunteers and the organizations. And, and uh, it's, it's great to see. We had a reception here yesterday for uh, the Irish cultural organizations and the leaders. And they were all telling bits about what they do. And, and it was just so impressive to see this, these volunteer efforts continuing to promote uh, not just Ireland, but their, their community and support each other, you know, which actually became... And like I'm sure for you, during the pandemic in particular, it was this this facility, this ability to engage with people even in a pandemic, absolutely enormously important to people, you know? Well, we've grown to the point where we have an audience that's worldwide. Yeah, yeah. That's one of the benefits you can actually get on, on going virtually, you know, and you can 
put it on YouTube as well. But you're right, you know, having having that reach, people can. My God, God rest him. My my predecessor here, Jim Kelly, who very sadly passed away uh, on St Patrick's Day last, only fifty six, but. I remember he was saying to me that he did something virtual in, 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 uh, right at the outset. And some guy called him up from Alberta or something. He says, I can't believe I have the ambassador, the Irish ambassador in my living room. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> and, and Bloomsday Montreal is in, the book, is, is in John McCourt's book too. Oh. He mentions sure. from Montreal to Mumbai. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you again, yes, everyone. Thanks. Thank you, Edmund. Thank you, thank you, Kevin. Thank you, John. Thank you, Edmund. Thanks very much. It's a pleasure for me. Let's look with the rest of it. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Yeah, yeah. Thanks again. Look forward to hopefully doing this again at some point. And thanks for sharing, Dennis. It was wonderful. Uh, my pleasure to listen to you, both of you. Thank you so much. And thank Edmund. You. Yeah, thank you too. Thanks, You're Edmund. Welcome. Thank you all. Thank you. Well done. Uh, thank you. Bye. Meeting in okay. 10 all seconds. right, signing off. Look forward to meeting you, John. Yeah, take oh, care. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Be well. Stay yeah. safe. Find in Barney Kiernan's maybe one of these years. <laughs> <laughs> I'll play the citizen. <laughs> yeah. Hello again. Oh, wasn't that fantastic? They covered so many aspects of Joyce's work, world literature, world history. It really took my breath away. It has been an honor to have His Excellency Eamon McKee Professor John McCourt and broadcaster Dennis Trudeau accept our invitation to kick off this year's festival. Now, on behalf of our board of directors and our supporters, I want to acknowledge our sponsors, Canadian Heritage, the Embassy of Ireland, the Zeller Family Foundation, Concordia School of Irish Studies, McGill Centre for Lifelong Learning, the Atwater Library, the Westmount Public Library, and the Jewish Public Library. Montreal's St. Patrick's Society, and individual contributors. Please consider becoming one. Thank you. <laughs>